Well, welcome to the show. Today, we have a friend of mine joining, a longtime friend. What? How long have we known each other, Tony? Uh, ben? Yeah, it seems like it's been a while. It's been great, though. It's been a wonderful journey. Being yeah, in your absolutely. Life. absolutely. And so, even better for you to be in mine. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so this is Tony. Um, Tony is a, uh, he lives in yeah, roughly the same geographical area I do. Uh, how do you describe it? I describe it Rocky Mountain region. How do you describe it? Uh, I was thinking I live east of the Pacific Northwest. Okay, <laughs> that's perfect. That That's roughly <laughs> okay. where we live. And um, the reason we're somewhat, uh, you know, when I mean, we're given our real first names and such, we just, you know, we're both business people and we kind of uh, live in two separate worlds, our philosophic worlds, and then also the real world. And yeah, we just prefer to keep certain things offline. Um, and it allows us to feel like we can speak a little bit more openly. I think we're going to be honest any which way, but that, that lets us speak a little bit more openly. Um, so Tony, roughly, uh, what was your law enforcement career? Like, like, how long were you a cop? Roughly where? Roughly what uh, things did you do as a cop? What uh, areas yeah, of work so, were you a motor cop? So most of the 90s um, and a little bit of the 2000s and uh, in, in a really big area of Southern California, we covered, I covered, I guess you could say, and we never did everything from uh, custody to patrol to exciting uh, special details out there that, you know, are, um, are the cool guy stuff where you get to wear the jeans and, and the, the casual shirts and all that. And you didn't really <laughs> have to answer calls. You just got to go look for the tough, tough guys. And you tried to be tougher than them. Right. Exactly. 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 You know, one of the most exciting things when I kind of put myself back in the, uh, the jack boots uh, th that I once was. When I put myself in those shoes again, I remember some of the guys talking about uh, working the uh, undercover drugs. They were trying to get the reefers off the street or the marijuanas or whatever. And uh, they would be on these teams and they'd be following somebody from the Southern California area to Las Vegas. And they would have, you know, five or six cars because they couldn't have the same car right behind the suspect the whole time or the suspect would catch on. And so they were kind of leapfrogging and just hauling butt 130 miles an hour down the freeway knowing they wouldn't go to jail for it um, well they're they are part of the public safety system so it makes sense for them to do that <laughs> exactly why not go that fast out with, where families are trying to get back from vegas uh, right you know that was part of the reason i got into law enforcement embarrassingly now but i like driving fast i had that young man adrenaline thing and i i talked to some of the southern california cops who had kind of said you know you get to drive fast you get in fights, you'll never lose because you just, you know, your radio call away from the uh, the blue army, the blue wave is going to be right there. And so you can, you get in fights, you, you drive fast and you never get in trouble with the law. Like it's all legal. Yeah. And you get to carry a gun in California anywhere, yeah. <laughs> bars, churches, anything, your house. I mean, <laughs> and even while you're at work. So, you know, that's, that's probably one of the reasons I got suckered into it was, I was trying to figure out how to just be an honest law abiding citizen that was able to protect myself. And I thought, well, crap, the only way I can do it is with a badge. So <laughs> and in California, even back in the nineties, it was, there was no concealed weapons permits or anything like that. And man, if you were going, you were going to jail, if you got caught with a gun in your car or anything, if you weren't part of the special program, you know, yeah. If you didn't have the brass pass, you were in the brass trouble. pass. That's right. Yeah. Guaranteed to get you out of DUIs and traffic tickets. Yep. Yep. And there were, what were some of the things that uh, you would do back in the day, you and your girlfriend or wife or whatever, driving along and you get pulled over for speeding. Uh, what were some of the fun things you would do to let the guy know that, Hey, we're on the same team. Let's be corrupt here and let me go. Right. You do the old, uh, uh, excuse me, officer, I have a gun in my car. By the way, I'm a bleep, bleep, bleep officer of bleep, bleep. And, you know, it's, oh, 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 well, yeah, we're all part of the same team. Have a good day, buddy. And, you know, they go pick on someone that, you know, wasn't part of the clan. Yeah, exactly. I remember I would uh, train a, a girlfriend to say, to to just start saying to me, honey, show me your badge, show me your badge. And and then I would turn it, hey, hey, honey, it's okay, it's okay, honey. And make it look like she was the one that was trying to pull the thing. And uh, and then of course, a couple of, I understand, I understand. Hey, you, you have a good night. You know what it's like out there. But yeah, you know, same it, thing. Yeah, the worst is when you do it and you pull over a cop. I had a cop almost run over my boots pulling away from me on a traffic stop because he just barely had enough time to show me his badge and then took off. Cause you know, he was important. I mean, exactly. You no know, time yeah. for me. Jeez. I remember one of the quotes I heard is uh, in the guys, and we thought it was funny at the time. Uh, if you're going to enforce the law, you might as well be above it. That's right. <laughs> and, 
<laughs> and it was like a funny joke at the time. And, and I didn't realize because I didn't even think of morality at that point. And I didn't realize what a jerk that made me. And I, I actually thought it was funny. I mean, I pay your tax money, some citizen would say. And then the cop would flip a quarter to him. And, and you know, this is all you put in a year. You know, here's your money back. Uh, shut right. up. And yeah. now I think about, you know, even if law enforcement, if a person wasn't a voluntarist and said, hey, it's cool for governments to steal money from people and then hire people to enforce what the government wants, even if you thought that was acceptable, if they were only good cops, even if you thought that was acceptable, that is so rude to treat your employer, your citizen like that. It's unbelievable. Right. Yeah. yeah. I, I remember sitting at in and out Burger and of course, you know, they don't let you pay or they don't let you pay full price. And uh, when you're in uniform, of course, but I remember thinking we'd sit around and if people thought, oh, look at those guys just sitting around their patrol cars, eating a hamburger. We always, we always had the line ready that we don't get paid for what we do. We get paid for what we might have to do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. What is it? 99% boredom and 1% sheer terror. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And what's the statistic anyway? Isn't it like 5% of crimes are actually prevented by some sort of government authority, if it's even that many or something like that? I know it's a very, very low, for what, for what taxpayers pay, it seems like it's a pretty low number. Yeah. Yes. And I don't know what the number is, but I actually had a sergeant, a status sergeant, who said to me once when I said something like, well, we, you know, made it through the night and we kept anybody from stealing anything in our town. And he says, oh, he says, you know, watch it. He says, because if they had stolen something, would you be able to say uh, that it was your, would you admit that it was your fault? And I said, well, no, I can't be everywhere all the time. And he says, well, <laughs> if you're not going to admit that you are, you know, wrong, then you can't claim the credit for being right either, which I think is an excellent point made by a police sergeant that, right. uh, yeah, you're not really doing that much. You're driving around. You're driving the same areas that you always do. You're never going down that one alley that you never go down because you don't get around to it. And I, did you did you find a lot of stuff? And when I say stuff, I mean bad stuff like people hurting each other. I'm not talking about drugs or or prostitution or something, but actual crimes where somebody was getting hurt. Did you run across much of that just by out patrolling, looking for bad stuff? You know, a lot of it would be uh, the good stuff, the stuff that, you know, cops, I personally think cops should actually be going after or, or you know, maybe can actually, I don't know, but, but you know, a stolen car that was carjacked from an old lady uh, coming across something like that or hearing the shots and then watching a car screel, screech away and, um, you know, things like that. You come across it on occasions, of course, and that's that little bit of adrenaline that you're excited about, but uh, I, I think the embarrassing thing for me was when I wasn't doing that. And when I was, when it was more of a, you know, pulling someone over because they ran a stop sign when the only person who was around the four way stop was me waiting for someone to stop, go through the stop sign and not stop, you know? Yeah. And, or, or, you know, you pull someone over and is that, is that marijuana as I smell, you know? And it's <laughs> like, huh. I mean, I don't know about you, but come to find out from the statistics now with some of these legal states, you actually drive better under the influence of marijuana than if you're sober, I guess. Oh, really? Yeah, you know, you, you, you drive slower and you're more cautious. I don't know. That's what they say. But, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of funny. Yeah, yeah. What, and, you know, it, that brings up an interesting point, the different propaganda that we were fed. And I was a naive Midwestern kid when I became a cop. And, and I would say, wow, we actually got to have the former assistant director of the training academy of the National Transportation Safety Board put on this training. This person really knows a lot about safety. So when this person explains why a blood alcohol level of 0.08 is so dangerous, and if they made it 09, millions of people would die. I'm like, oh, okay. But I bought into it, hook, line, and sinker. But at 07999, they don't get to go to jail at all. <laughs> exactly. Perfectly safe to drive. <laughs> this is an arbitrary thing. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so what boy. do you think now when you look back at uh, some of the things you did? And you grew up in a, a, a more street smart area than I did. I was very naive when I got into law enforcement. So you were already much more uh, street smart when you got into it. How, how do you think a, do you think a, a, a private person uh, or a pri like as a, a private security agent, a, a well-trained one, do you think they would be able to do the same important stuff that a cop did? Or is there some magic that comes from the Capitol or what? It 
Yeah, you know, I, I mean, I, I was sworn in at 20 years old. Um, zero education except for a, uh, uh, what do you call that, a certificate they give you after going through the schooling system thing, uh, graduation from high school. That's, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I, I think, I, well, and I started uh, a junior college and ended up taking a criminal justice class. And then there was a recruiter for the department I ended up going to work for. And I mean, kind of like my dad says, they hired me. (laughs) (laughs) It's like no education, but suddenly I get to be a doctor, a lawyer, um, a law enforcement officer, a judge, if you think about it, because you you gotta make these split, split second decisions. And I mean, I was fortunate that I kind of got to make a lot of my mistakes working, working in jails and, you know, but uh, because, you know, once they're in jail, they're already guilty. Right. I mean, that's what we thought. Obviously. I mean, I don't care if you're going through a trial or not. If you made it this far, then gosh, darn it. You were smoking marijuana. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) You're a scumbag dirt bag. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, You, you hired a woman for sex. Oh, that's it. You're going to not only be embarrassed, you're going to do hard time. <laughs> <laughs> Which makes the world such a better place. Yeah, we're going to show you a whole new type of sex in this jail. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> well, and I do think about the difference. Uh, there's no real difference between what we did and what a, a person could do if they were not a quote unquote sworn cop, if they didn't have statutes and such. And, and I try to think about various jobs in life in in a free society there's no such thing as a utopian society that could exist but if if more of my ideal society existed a stateless society well would there still need to be roads yes would somebody still need to you know would you need a half a dozen guys to stand around leaning on shovels to help build the roads yes you would still need those things so those guys i'm not as angry at as i would be some job that would not exist if it wasn't for the state, like a marijuana enforcement cop, like in a free market, there would be no marijuana enforcement cops. And so I do have respect for the person in the village, be the village, 100 people or 100,000 or 10 million. There got to be some big, rough, tough guys in the village who walk around with a big stick, they walk softly. And when they see somebody hurting somebody else, they jump in, and they're practiced and they're savvy and, and they have advanced now techniques of collecting fingerprints and interviewing people and and like I I see that that job needs to exist but I don't think that it needs to be a a state sponsored it doesn't need to be a state monopoly job what are your thoughts on that yeah you know someone someone has to protect those that can't I mean an 85 year old grandmother living by herself you know yeah there's going to be a bad person that's going to kick in her door and steal all of her Metamucil and all of her prescription medication and all that <laughs> stuff and probably her cigarettes, you know, but, and, and who's going to protect her from that? You know, can she even pull a trigger on a gun if she was allowed to carry the gun or keep a gun in her house? Um, I, I think the frustrating point is when it gets to the, the um, traffic stops for going five miles over the speed limit and, you know, uh, gee, it does smell. And, you know, we keep bringing this up, but it, because it is so minor, but like, it smells like marijuana, step out of your vehicle. And now they're searching your vehicle and they're, they're going through possibly your phone or personal items or documents or something as if they're really looking for a little bit of weed. They're not, they're looking for something bigger. We knew that like you pull over for the old broken tail light and you're hoping that the guy's a, an ex con or he's carrying a gun or he's even just got weed or meth on him or something like that. And, you know, the amount of money and, and resources we spend on for example, going after um, the Johns, as they called them, or going after the prostitutes and, you know, two consensual adults wanting to to have a little business arrangement. I mean, my gosh, I I hate to say this, but I was explaining this to my daughter just today where it's like how I don't, how, how the victimless crime thing is really frustrating to me because as a single man, I can take a girl to Vegas for the weekend. We're probably going to get along really well and do things together, you know, Uh, but I can't, and I wouldn't anyway, personally, but if other people wanted to, that's great, but I can't drive down the street and pay someone 50 or a hundred bucks or something like that because it's a crime, but I could spend three grand in Vegas and, you know, I mean, gee, aren't I a nice guy, you know? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And so I I don't know. There's just, that's the part where I start to quite honestly lose respect for the cops. And it's where I find my guilt from when I was, it's 
that guilt of looking back and saying, ah, oh, geez, I, I actually took a guy to jail for that. And why, why, you know, because yeah. it was John Doe versus the state of California. And I feel like anytime it's versus the state of California, that just means there's no other victim for them to have. And so they're going to throw you in jail for something that had no victim because suddenly they're the victim, you yeah. know? Yeah. I, that, that's such a good point. And there's the respect thing for me is so big. And I kind of realized that working as a cop, that if I was only going to work, protecting little old ladies who had their cars carjacked. And when I was off duty, I was eating right and exercising, taking martial arts lessons and working out, really trying to be ready and prepared to be the protector of the people, the weak people who needed outside protection. That is an honorable job. And maybe not if the state sponsored it, but that is an honorable function that somebody can do in society. But then when I would go and do something like well, I'm just following orders. I mean, what a wimpy, like you're not a, you're not an, an alpha male if you say, well, I'm just following orders. Yeah, I don't agree with this, but I just, I have to, it's my job. Like to lower yourself to that. And I did it all the time. Right. Yeah, just well, you're just doing your job. You're just doing your job. Yeah. And, and you know. now I look back and I'm like, I want a protector you know, I, and at this point, I'm still young enough. I don't really feel like I need them because I live in a rural area. If I was in South Central Los Angeles and there were, you know, hundreds or thousands of guys, bad guys who might want to get me, okay, now I'd like to have a few other people in my in my corner. But I'm, you know, pretty feel pretty safe right now. But I respect a protector who would go to their their boss and say, "Hey, boss, just so you know, I'm going to keep patrolling, keep doing my thing, but I'm not going to mess with people over a little." chicken shit stuff somebody runs a stop sign if if i'm not like whoa that was dangerous then i'm not going to mess with it and if somebody's driving their nice new fancy car that can handle 100 miles an hour and they're driving at 85 and a 55 i don't care if it's not dangerous i'm not going to do anything about it and i'm not going to enforce those anymore and, and there's proof that it's not dangerous and where the proof is is when you see these videos of a, a, a police officer pulling over well, another police officer or a district attorney going 100 miles an hour in a 65 mile an hour zone. And suddenly it's not a danger to society anymore because of who the person is. So, you know, yeah, it, it's just it, it's frustrating if they're able to make the decision to not do something, then suddenly that something clearly isn't a public safety hazard. And if you're able to drive 120 miles an hour without your lights and sirens on to get somewhere, then clearly someone else going 120 miles an hour isn't bad either because there's nothing different with it. Yep. What, you took, you took a two-week class on a driving course at the Pomona Fairgrounds or something like that, and now suddenly you can, you can drive 120 plus miles an hour safely? I don't think so. Yeah, exactly. And if there is a way to do that, then wouldn't it just make sense so that you don't have to tax people against their will? Wouldn't it make sense? Like if you and I right now, we went out and the roads became privatized and we bought them, we would probably make rules. Hey, for safety's sake, you can't go over such and such a speed, but we would probably have graduated things where we say, okay, you have a nice Porsche and you are 35 years old. You have your, your senses about you. If you go to this three week course at the Pomona fairgrounds and because get better training than the, the former cops did now, you can go 90 in this area. Everybody else has to go 70. Like that would make sense as entrepreneurs to say, okay, if we want it safe, but as long as it's safe, let's have graduated levels on our private roads. But of course that would never work public. I mean, nobody's going to come up with that idea or risk getting fired for having stupid ideas. Right. And plus what's, what's the speed limit going to be for like the 1970s Dodge Omni 024? That's what you got to ask yourself. <laughs> That would be the big challenge. Okay, you know what? We need a state. I think we've just proved it. We've got to have a government because without there them, you go. Just... Oh, darn it! All right. Well, this yeah. this video is over. Well, we tried. <laughs> <laughs> so, what do you think when we talk about these uh, victimless crimes? And, and there's a there's a something called a thick red line program or, or thing going on where basically it's cops who say, you know what? I want my respect back. I want people to look at me and say, yeah, that's the tough guy protector who walks softly and carries a big stick and he's here to help. And when bad stuff happens, he'll jump in the middle of it, but he's not going to mess with people over, 
over victimless crimes. Um, what do you think about that? Do you think any cops uh, on a large scale, other than, I mean, I guess there are probably five or 10,000 that have joined this thick red line thing, but do you think on a larger scale that that will take off or are cops too scared to keep their bureaucratic jobs? Yeah, you know, I think um, I think it could certainly take off. And I think, you know, the respect thing is, is something we all want. We want it as parents. We want it as, as friends from our friends. Um, we want it in our jobs. We want it from our bosses. We want it from subordinates and all that stuff. And cops want the respects too. Unfortunately, they're not trained to know how to go about getting the respect because they think that once they graduate the academy and are given a badge and a gun, that they automatically <laughs> deserve respect. Well, we know that's not the case. And I, I think that if they did want the respect, yeah, showing that they're out saving good people from really bad people is is the way to start going about it and and you know writing a guy a ticket or harassing a guy for 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 speeding or harassing a guy for some some weed or you know i know this isn't a popular thing but you know meth doesn't hurt anyone except the person they're using that are using it and you know of course there's an issue where there could you can go down the rabbit hole of child endangerment if you're a father raising a small child and now you're whacked out on meth and you know you're hurting the child okay then that becomes where the child needs a protector. And that's where that cop can come in. But man, you get a guy who wants to, and I've never done this, honestly, but you get a guy that wants to snort a line at a party and he's got a little Coke on him or something. Like, how is that, how is that a bad thing? But you get a guy who wants to take someone's car at gunpoint and that person just isn't able to protect themselves, then darn it, they need someone to help. And, and, and that's where a cop can start getting the respect back, I think. Yep. And, you know, I think it kind of goes back to, and I don't know that I remember all five of them, but Larkin Rose has some questions that that kind of, they're, they're meant to ask somebody and gosh, I hear them and I, I try to argue with them as I, as I think, and as I sleep for the next six months and damn it, I can't think I, you know, I, I, I can't come up with a better answer. One of them is, can you uh, extend to someone else a right that you don't have? And so if it, like you have a right, if somebody breaks into your house right now, you have a right to grab them and throw them out of your house, but you don't have a right to go out to people who are driving by on the road and throw bottles at their car. So you could hire somebody to throw people out of your house when they break in, but you can't hire somebody to go down to the highway and throw bottles at cars that are driving by. And sure. so if I can't hire somebody to go out and stop somebody from using Coke or meth or heroin or, or the marijuanas or whatever. If it's not cool for me to do that, then how can I think that it's okay for me to, even if I make it two or three steps separated, I, I vote for someone who then hires somebody who has an employee who does that same thing. No, if it ain't cool to throw bottles at passing cars, it ain't cool. Right. And that question, I, I look back and one of my FTOs in, in Southern California, a little beach town, he actually sat me down before we went out on patrol on the first time on field training, the uh, uh, first part of it. And he had me do the research. He says, what gives you the right to be a police officer? And I'm like, well, I'm a cop, like post certified, like I have a badge. And he's like, no, 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 statutorily, what gives you the right? And then he finally had to help me because I'm not that bright or I wouldn't have gotten onto the department. And so he... <laughs> He had you to kind of, smart enough not to do it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so he shows, he has to show me in the book that according to the 32nd legislature of California, 1839, whatever, that um, hereby grants the authority to the governor to appoint a special commission that thereby certifies peace officers, blah, 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 blah. And he's like, that's what gives you the authority. And I, at the time, thought that's a bunch of useless stuff. Like I'm a cop. That's why I can do it. Yeah. And I mean, it almost sounds like the guy's arguing in idiocracy, but um, about, you know, the plants love it and well, it has electrolytes. Um, <laughs> and, and I was being that dumb. But now I look back at it, I'm like, wait a minute. This was just a bunch of people in a big building with marble floors talking about stuff. And they're wearing suits and they're writing things down. And that doesn't count. And, and Shepard, that's what scares me the most 
most about the we're just doing our job mindset. And that's, you know, we've seen this over the last couple of years with COVID and businesses being forced to shut down, private businesses being forced to shut down. And because some guys in suits in, in neat buildings that the, that the taxpayers paid for came up with some laws that enough of them agreed with. And now suddenly um, we've got a guy with a badge and a gun showing up to enforce those laws and their excuses were just doing our job. And it's like, yeah, but you're doing it for someone who just did something that you swore to uphold the constitution, let's say, you know, uh, your oath to, to, you know, keep people free and safe. And now you're not doing that anymore because some bureaucrat told you to do something different. And because you want a paycheck, you're going to do it. And that's where I think the educated people start losing respect for the, for law enforcement. Yes. I think that people who don't have as much formal scholastic education have all for, for many years have viewed there's the gang of blue or sheriff's department green in Southern California. There's the, the gang of blue and the gang of green. And those are gangs. There's also a gang that has red as its primary color and another one that has blue and, and so on and so forth. And they're all just gangs. And that's how they see it is these are the rules of the street. That gang will come and they'll put me in a cage. We don't put people in cages. We pop a cap. Um, we, we each have different ways of punishing each other when we do something. You better watch out for that when they're tough. And yeah, I, I don't think they see the nuances of the word games and, and the mental, the, the most dangerous superstition of believing that government can have more authority than just regular individuals. That's, yep. So another thing, Tony, you, you mentioned this early uh, earlier about um, morals and kind of a guilt, you said, uh, about the things you feel guilty about. And I'll just tell you quickly something I feel guilty about. Maybe you can think of an example uh, from your career. And, and this is kind of, I think, my way of, of apologizing to everyone and saying, I can't take back everything, but I can admit where I'm wrong, give a few examples. I can't even remember all the times I harmed people. But one of them was, um, I'm out at, you know, 130 in the morning, whatever it was. And I see a, a, get somebody on a bicycle go through a stop sign at probably five miles an hour ish. And I went up and pulled alongside him, which is against policy because they could shoot you and you have to be watch out for officer safety because, you know, it's important to fear for your life frequently. And so I pull up beside him, even though I shouldn't have. And I said, hey, man, will you do me a favor and stop at stop signs? And his response was, F you, there's nobody out here. And I'm like, whoa, I just experienced contempt of cop. And I don't like it when there's contempt of cop. So I said, hey, man, just stop at stop signs. And I'm still beside him at this point just planning to drive away. He still had this attitude. So I pulled him over, got behind him, turned the lights on, he pulls over. He keeps having this complete attitude. I, I decide finally, you know what? Forget it. I'm writing this guy a ticket after all. And so I get the ticket book out. What's your name? I don't remember. And I'm, well, I want to see your ID. I don't have it with me. And he's just completely not complying. Well, in the state that I was in, you can't you know, a citation when they sign it is basically saying, I promise to appear in court. That's why I don't have to take them to jail is because they're promising to appear. Well, if you won't give me your name, then you can't sign saying you promise to appear. Well, I still didn't want to take the guy to jail. This is ridiculous. Even then I knew it. Called my sergeant. He came. He tried to talk the guy into just signing the ticket. Guy wouldn't do it. I ended up arresting this guy and taking him to jail. And I didn't take him to jail for running the stop sign. Like that wasn't the original intent. But that's what started the whole thing. And I took a human being's freedom away from them. I put a human being in a cage overnight and cost them probably a few hundred bucks. I did that to another human being. And that ain't cool. And that's something you feel guilt about. Hundreds of other things like that. But that's something you feel guilt about. Yeah. And, and, you know, this is one of the times, you know, how with your friends, you always like to have those stories where you like to top each other. And unfortunately, this is not one of those times you want to top someone. And, and I would yeah. have to probably say that um, imposing martial law on an entire society during the, I think they were, they were dubbed the Rodney King riots um, and, and sitting, you know, I, I don't know, shoulder to shoulder, standing shoulder to shoulder with the, the national guard. And after whatever it was, nine o'clock at night, if anyone I don't care if you were coming home from work. I don't care if you were a working man going to your house. If you were out at night, you were going to jail. And that's that's probably the, the biggest one for me. 
I um, hear you. You know, I mean, yeah, you, I could go, I, we could spend hours probably going over it. And, and yeah, it, it's, it is tough. Is it, um, does it make you lose sleep at night? Yeah, probably sometimes it does. It does. Does it make you want to drink a little more or something else? Yeah, probably. Um, because you, you grow up. I don't know how else to put it. You grow up. It doesn't mean that you get older. It means that you grow your way of thinking about things. Um, to realize that everything that you learned um, wasn't true, wasn't right. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, people that smoke marijuana are not really smoking the devil's lettuce. It's not from Satan itself, you know? <laughs> um, and yeah, it's just those little things where you just start, you just shake your head and you're like, and you know, you want, you got kids and you want your kids to think, oh yeah, my dad was a police officer, but quite honestly, you want your kids to know that, yeah, but he didn't do things right. They were legal. They were legal. They did not, I, you know, there were no crimes committed, but they weren't right. And that's, yeah. that's what I have a tough time with. Um, and, and that's, what's been nice, quite honestly, with friends with you and other people that have either been in the military or in law enforcement that now realize that those types of jobs, uh, force you to do things that are so against your morals and in your belief system that it's nice to kind of have other people that understand the guilt you feel and help you get through it, you know? Yeah. So going back to what you said just a little bit ago about uh, the guilt, um, there's something that Rayford Davis, I believe his name is uh, another former police officer. He's talked about this. I just found out about this guy and heard a podcast uh, recently. Uh, and he was talking about this, this guilt this remorse that police officers feel and military uh, people feel as well. And it's when you do something that you know isn't right and you do it because you're following orders, but you knew you shouldn't have put those people in that oven and turned it on. And you were just following orders, but you know it was wrong. Or you know you shouldn't take a person's freedom away because they rolled through a stop sign doing the responsible thing, taking a bicycle home from a bar instead of a car or the example you gave that guilt that was like, it, it, it's not PTSD or whatever, but I think it's a legitimate thing. W what are your thoughts? Yeah. Well, just by you bringing up the oven, which of course is the flag flashbacks of the Holocaust it made me think while you were talking, um, how, how long, how long have we been doing this, doing things that are so outside of our, our, what should absolutely be our moral compass because it was our job, because it's what, what we were told to do. It's because someone else got us to believe that that's the way we should think. Uh, you know, I mean, oh man, it, what the, the types of things. So going back to your, your original question, things that make me feel guilty is the way they you know, I hate to, to use this blame, but the way that they train us to look at people that aren't like us, I don't know how else to put it without sounding really bad. Um, whether it's an income aspect, whether it's the fact that they're not half Italian like me, whether it's, you know, um, where, where I grew up compared to where they grew up, the type of first car I had compared to the type of first car they had, the vacations I had compared to the vacations they didn't have, you know, the the guilt of, of thinking that I was better than them. And, and I will say this, there was an old timer and, and a close friend of mine still. I'm, I'm in now my early fifties. He is in his mid eighties. So to give you an idea, but he was on the, the department. Uh, he was out about the same time I came in, he retired. And um, I will never forget one of the first things he told me about being a cop. He said, when you're working in the jails, always remember the people that are in jail some of those guys are going to be better than your supervisors. And, you know, I mean, man, did, did I let that really sink in? I remembered it, but did I let that sink in when I was demeaning some guy because he didn't pick up his clothing off the ground quick enough in the jail or, you know, whatever other minor thing or, or you know, when he was trying to give me an excuse to get out of a speeding ticket? Um, no, I didn't. And, and that's, that's what sucks. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, there's just, there's so much of that guilt feeling. Uh, am I, am I walking around life with a heavy bag on my back because of this? Honestly, no, I'm not because I'm no longer living that anymore. I'm not 
perpetuating those ridiculous things upon other people. Um, yeah, I, I just, I don't know. It's, it, it's nice that I'm not doing it anymore. And those that are, I can only hope and pray that, um, <laughs> that for those of you, for those of you out there that watch all of Shepard's podcasts or YouTube's <laughs> or whatever these things are called, um, you know, that, that the guys that are out there still doing it are really going after the really, really bad dudes, not the guys that are just kind of trying to get to work and, 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 run, you know, provide for their families and stuff like that. But, but go after the guys that, that are hurting the people they can't help to yep. protect that can't excuse me that can't protect themselves or help themselves you know um i mean that's that's what i hope for and that's what i hope for for the few friends that i still have in law enforcement yeah that i know so I remember there's an old timer that gave me some good advice once we were talking about uh, the guy was in town that, that one of the original videos of uh, filming the police doing bad stuff and this was probably in the eight, late 80s early 90s and there was somebody who in long beach california and it was an off-duty uh, black police sergeant, and he would go around and kind of agitate the cops a little bit, do things in such a way that he was likely to get messed with, and then it was filmed, and then he would put it out there that this is what happened, and they slammed him into a, the cops in Long Beach slammed him into a, a, a building, uh, into a glass storefront, and it shatters, and the, the media made a huge thing out of it. I later say, saw it in a... Uh, um, uh, training a police training showing that the guy as his head was going toward the glass he purposefully head butted it to make a bigger deal out of it anyway that guy came to our little beach town in southern california and was trying to egg cops on and so the alert went out all the cops knew he was there he was looking for trouble the old timer tells me he says don't worry about any of that stuff he says don't worry about the policy or the laws or anything like that. He says, if after you have an interaction with somebody, you can look at them in the eye, look them in the eye, and you can say, hey, man, this is why I did what I just did. He said, then you'll be just fine. And he says, if you smack them around and throw them down, he says, as long as you can, in all honesty, mano y mano, look at each other and say, hey, this is why I did that. You had an attitude. You came up to me and put your finger in my chest. You don't do that. I'm going to clock you. Okay, two guys can understand that, two, especially two street guys like a cop and a gangbanger. They can understand it. And some of those old timers, I think after 20 or 30 or 40 years out there, they were tough, tough old coots. But I think they started to kind of come around and realize some things that I wish we young whippersnappers had understood right. a, a little bit better. Yep. Well, I will say, you know, I, I apologize if this is off topic, but but the frustration I have with, you know, the movements against law enforcement and all that, the frustration I have is not the movements because, my gosh, I mean, you know, freedom isn't free, right? So we're all allowed to go do what we, we want to do in this free country. And if they want to protest, please, then, then have at it, right? But um, is that as cops say they want to change and do things different, they're still having the old cops do the trainings, it's like te telling an old dog to go teach new dogs completely different things that the old dog ever learned. And, yep. and, and that's what's frustrating. And I just keep seeing this thing going over and over and over. And, oh, we're going to bring in, you know, a narco sergeant from, you know, the 70s. And he's going to tell you how to go after bad guys. It's like, no, because that guy was slamming people into the cement to, <laughs> to yep. bust them for marijuana. That was a felony back then. You know, why are we continually doing this? Why aren't there more civilian review boards? Why aren't there former cops who are critical of cops helping cops figure out what they should be doing? You know, I don't know. It's just, it's a, it's a frustrating system. And my fear is that if they don't do something like what we're talking about, where they can show that they're going after the, um, the real, the true bad guys and not the pretend bad guys, let's just be honest, then I, I just don't know if it's going to get better or not. Yep. Yep. And it's, I think that there would be actual citizen support. Good citizens would support the cops who would come out and you don't rat your buddies out for little stuff. I completely get that. You don't want to get a rat jacket and like that. That's not, I'm not saying go out and be a rat, but instead maybe be a man. And, and I recall in my little 
police department in the Rocky Mountains, I had a guy, the, the department messed up. They knew I was kind of a rogue kind of guy. Like I was a bad cop. So they knew I was a rogue kind of guy, but the real field training officer didn't show up one day. And I had a new guy that came out and rode with me. And I said, listen here, kid. And, you know, and I'm trying to be Mr. Tough guy at 28 years old or whatever. And he was probably 30. And I said, so here, here's the deal. I said, there are going to be some things that happen out here that, you know, you just don't talk about and blah, blah, blah. And he looks at me and he kind of grins and he says, Hey, you know, thanks. And he says, but I know who I am and don't do bad stuff around me. And I'm not going to say anything about it. And I'm like, that is the kind of cop at that point. I'm like, Hey, you didn't respect my authority and think that I was tough. But now I realize that's the kind of cop that you don't go rat your partners out, but you go to your partners and say, Hey man, just so you know, I'm kind of done with that. Like, I'm doing the thick red line thing and I'm not going to put up that kind of crap. So if you want to do it, just don't do it around me. Kind of like beating women. You can beat women. Just don't do it around me or I'll kick your ass. Just yeah. like put, the, put the rules out there. That's what I'm going to do. But I think that needs to happen more. Yeah, I do too. Hey, maybe it's a rhetorical question. I, I can't figure out why the domestic violence numbers are so much higher for people that are in law enforcement than those that aren't from a per capita mindset. And, and that's just, again, that's rhetorical because no one has that answer. It's just, it, it kind of blows my mind. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I remind that last story you said reminded me of, uh, you know, when your training officer said, okay, now that you graduated the academy, forget everything you learned because this is how it's really done. <laughs> yep, exactly, exactly. <laughs> yes, sir. Okay, sir. Yep, yep. Oh, oh we don't have to, we don't have to have probable cause to stop him. Okay, sir. Yeah, which of course I, we always did, but you know. Well, I was told when I'm like, "Why are we pulling this car over?" And he looked at me, and says, "Kid, you'll think of it by the time you get up to their window." Yeah. And so you would think, "Oh, the tire tread was too thin." You know, it was supposed to be one twenty eighth of an inch, and driving along, I could tell it was just a little too, you know, bald. And of course, I care for their safety. If their tire blows out, they could kill little <laughs> children and nuns. Like we, you know, <laughs> got to watch out here. Uh, but yeah, that was the same. Yeah, taught the same right. thing, and. Now I look back at it and I'm like, that's messed up. And then there were some things that on the street, if you look at a bigger city, there are some really tough bad guys there and somebody really tough needs to go up against them. And you can't do it by having a master's degree in public administration and being right. goody two shoes. You can't. Right. You have you to go spend four years in the desert shooting, shooting people from a different country and then come out here and, you know, and, that's what a lot of them think, right, wrong, or different. I don't know, but yeah, yep. that's what they end up finding. And that's, those are the guys that end up doing that. Yeah, you know? and there may be the, there seem to be kind of two kinds of people going into law enforcement. And one are the the type, oh, okay, the law says that I should mess with people who go one mile an hour over the speed limit. And then the other kind are the kind that, well, you know, really what I'm good at is killing people and obeying orders. So even if I can't kill as many now, maybe I can still shoot some dogs. But uh, even if, if I can't do that, at least I can still kind of carry a gun and go do some target shooting and be tough and tell people what to do. So yeah, it, the the people coming into law enforcement, neither are really that that self-confident guy that says, oh, you yeah, you're a lot younger than me. You can definitely kick my butt. You're going to die. You're going to die within minutes after that, but you can kick my butt. Just that confidence that you are the, the bad stops here. It stops right here. It's going no further. I don't care if I live or not, but it's stopping right here. Right. That kind of tough, self-confident, get it done person, that's not the same person that's going to write a ticket to somebody for going three miles an hour through a stop sign or smoking right. a joint. It's a different right. It's a different kind of human being. Yep. Yep. If, if I had to not, if I had to step away from, from the guilt that I have felt from the past, I, I will say that, you know, I, I, I wasn't too much of a nitpicker. And I think kind of the, the thing I have a tendency to say is that I've given back more weed than I'll ever be able to smoke in a lifetime, you know? <laughs> and so, because, you know, I don't know, man, I, you know, I got into plenty of fights with drunks, just never gotten into many fights with guys that were getting high on weed. <laughs> You know, they were just like, why are you here, man? <laughs> I remember my first international trip. I had the, I was ready to go. I had my days off and I was going to go to France for two weeks. And I'd arranged to get off a few hours early. I was supposed to be off at midnight. And at 1140, I get a call to a loud party. And I get there and sure enough, I smell the marijuanas. And so I go in and... I wasn't sure, like, I, I can't just ignore it. 
like then you're not a real cop so you've got to you can't be a schmuck so basically i said to everybody okay everybody look at me look at me you know like really trust me here i said i think that right before i got here somebody probably was at this party who had some marijuana they saw me coming they probably shoved it right under that mattress right there and then they ran out I'm going to step outside for a minute and go to my car. And then I'm going to come back and look under that mattress. And hopefully I can find that marijuana that somebody left. And the one guy looks at me, he's like, can I trust you, man? And I'm like, yeah. And so I walk out, I come back in and I lift the mattress up and there's some marijuana. And I'm like, holy cow. I said, let's get rid of this. I said, I don't want some kid finding this. Will you take this and flush it down the toilet? And they're like, yeah, absolutely. Let's keep these kids safe. And we took it and flushed a little bit. I'm sure they kept lion share to keep having the party. And I got I to go so. on my, what was that? I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> and I got to go on my vacation without having hours and hours of paperwork to do. Right. So yeah, I kind of like cops don't really care. Like if you do, you have an even lower IQ than the typical cop. I mean, that's, that's bad. Right. <laughs> Gosh. Oh, and you know, that is a thing. And I don't want to be down on myself. I think I slipped through and you obviously have a high IQ. I think I have an above average, <laughs> one. but well, no, I mean, I, I know you well enough that like there's some things that I'm not going to blow smoke and say that you're good at, but you are a really smart dude. Um, and, and I look at, I went to a Jay Leno show to the tonight show once. And the guy that was on there that night was a cop that had been, or he wanted to be a cop, but they wouldn't let him on because in the psychological test, his IQ was too high. So they wouldn't let him be a cop. And you know, I'm, I'm, of course I slipped through and I'm sure mine was way higher than his, but <laughs> why do you think some of the, re- I have some ideas. What are some of your ideas? Why a police department wouldn't want a creative thinker with a really high IQ to be a cop? I, I think if you pull too many layers of the onion off, you realize it's going to make you cry. I mean, <laughs> you know, and, and I, and I think if you get the guys that, you know, were either bullies or bullied in, in high school or in junior high or whatever, and you get the guys that, um, you know, are just kind of looking to, to hunt and fish for a living, you know, it, it's, then that's kind of, that's, that's the way to go. But if you get ones that are truly looking at something, or they even have that engineer mindset, like a, like a pilot, for example, where they got to kind of look at all the gauges and see how all the things run man if you start thinking that the justice system and like the 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 law enforcement system and the court like law enforcement and the court system i guess what i'm trying to say if you truly believe that those are two separate entities you're out of your flipping mind who's paying both entities the taxpayer is uh who is they, they both have the same thing you know, the same directive. And that is to, uh, you know, use the taxpayers money wisely, I guess, and take bad people off the streets. And so you go in there and the judge doesn't know you, but he sure as heck knows the officer that's testifying because that guy's been in court a hundred times and he's been right, 95 of them. So, you know, the unbiasedness just isn't there. And I think, and it took me a while to realize that quite honestly, it took me until I was a victim of brutality from law enforcement to even realize that it's a scam. And I got to believe if you got too high of an IQ, you're kind of going to figure that out sooner than later. And they're not going to, they're not going to get their value out of the money that they used to train you. Uh, Cause you're not going to stick around long. You're going to be like, Holy crap, get me out of here. This is just a bunch of guys that are just following orders <laughs> and not yeah. asking the right questions. Yep. I agree. You know, I was thinking as we were talking about another tough situation that we would put people in. And one of the things about being a man, and and I'm I'm saying this without apology, because I I do think there's a difference between like an alpha male and a female and a zur and a whatever. And a real man protects the women in his life. That's kind of just that's one of your jobs as a man that and you have to use the plunger in the toilet. And there, there's certain jobs that are blue jobs and there are certain jobs that are pink jobs. And one of the blue jobs by nature or whatever is your job is to protect, protect your family. And I recall, I, I don't remember why I went on this call, but I remember late at night being in an apartment and there was a mother in her mid forties 
with white pants on, really tight white jeans, and her adult son there. The mom was an alcoholic or whatever. She had crapped her pants, and there was an inch-wide brown smear going down the crack of her pants. Her son wasn't drunk. He was just a normal guy, embarrassed for his mom. She was probably the one that was yelling or whatever, the reason we got called to go there. She wasn't cooperating. And I don't remember if we were trying to get her ID or I don't remember why, but for some reason, I and the other cops ended up wrestling her to get her into handcuffs. Here is son standing there. He believes the most dangerous superstition. And part of the su this superstition is you don't, don't mess with authority when authority is doing their job. And so I put this poor young man in a position that might have made him a pussified dude for the rest of his life. Here he is. You're not a man if you watch three other men manhandle your mother and throw her on the floor and twist her arms behind her back. That shit's fucked up. Yep, it is. And it'll happen again, unfortunately. And, and, and that's not an isolated situation. And, but that feeling you have right now, absolutely feelings I have when I get triggered, for lack of a better word, uh, when I see cops doing things or watch crime shows on TV because it has something to do with maybe it's a little bit off, but it's also reminds me of something I did that I just feel like crap for. And yep. I mean, I, you know, I would say my, my, uh, story to compliment that is, um, arresting a guy. We went, it was a domestic thing or something. And, you know, she didn't want him to go to jail, but we had to send, bring him to jail. Cause you know, that's what we had to do because of, of the situation. And little kid came out to the car. I remember, I remember it clearly the house was up elevated, kind of a little hill. And then the patrol park car was parked there. And, <clears throat> and the, the wife says, go get daddy from the car. Don't let them take daddy to jail. <clears throat> and uh, so the, the little girl comes down and it's like, can, 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 can my dad come out of the car? And the mom just kept getting using her kind of as a shield and it ticked me off. And I looked at that kid <laughs> and I go, nope, your daddy's a bad man and he's going to jail. And holy crap, dude, what a stupid thing to say, you know? And, and yeah, it's, I mean, and, and, <laughs> That's what we were thought. That's what I thought. I thought he was a bad guy. You know, clearly the, the wife didn't think so, even though he just got finished beating her. But the fact that I had to say it in front of a kid, that's just one of those things that I, I remembered that I, I, I can't apologize to them directly for because yeah. I don't even know where it was. I yep. kind of remember the town, but I don't remember it. You know, and I don't yep. know the people. And yeah, it, but just, and man, if there are cops out there watching this stuff, I, I hope they're doing a better job. I hope yep. they're doing a better job and they're only going after those true, true bad people that are out victimizing the innocent that can't protect themselves. Yep. That's what I hope for. So what do we do? And I, I mean, you and me, and I mean, uh, another 100,000 cops. I hope that 100,000 are feeling this same guilt. It's very real. It's a good thing that you feel guilt. If you don't, you're a sociopath. So right. when you feel guilt about something, if you know the person directly, you can walk up to them and say, hey, man, I messed up. I'm sorry about that. And then they can either punch you and then you can say, okay, that's too much. And you can take them out. Or you can say, hey, I deserve that. Turn around and walk away. But you, you can kind of figure it out person to person. What do you do? Between us, we have thousands of victims in multiple states. We can, and then the, the it costs 100 grand a year to put a cop on the street when I was a cop. But, but you know, between hiring expenses and the, the vehicle and salary and benefits and all this. I can't give a million bucks back to society. I mean, who do you give it to? I don't want to give it back to Bernie Sanders, whoever they have as the president now. I don't want to give it back to them. So how do I get it to the right people? I don't know how to do that. And so I can apologize in a, a few videos on YouTube um, until they're considered conspiracies and taken down, I, I can I can apologize. But what else? What do we do to make it right? And honestly, if one of my old victims comes up here with a gun and tries to shoot me, I'm gonna fight him as best I can. I don't want to die, but sure. I still do feel badly. Like he's in the right. I just don't want to die, so I'd have to defend myself. What do we do to make stuff right? 
Yeah. And I guess I don't know, obviously, but what we could do is since we can't change things from the past, we could certainly live in the present and change the future by hopefully getting other people in law enforcement to not make the same mistakes. And, but I'll tell you what, it's, it's not easy because there's so much, as you know, so much peer pressure in law enforcement to do what everyone else is doing. And I mean, I even see it in the small town that I'm in. It's, it's crazy. Um, and, you know, and, and that's what drives me nuts in these small towns. These people are so bored that, yeah, they're, they're looking for anything. They're looking for anything to mess someone with. And, and there's not a lot, of, you know, there's a lot of people that are just, you know, praising the cops because they think that's what they should do. Just like with the military. OK, we bombed the wrong city or OK, we, you know, shot the wrong person or whatever. But we got to support them anyway. I mean, that's there, there's always going to be that blind support. Um, but man, if they don't change, if they don't break the peer pressure, if they don't break the bad culture that law enforcement has, we're stuck, man. Yep. And, and they will keep doing, and they hopefully will grow out of it like we did when I say grow out of it again, kind of mature in their mind and, and see that their morals don't, um, don't align with the law that they've been, they've been supporting and, you know, make the change or they won't. Yeah. And I see it kind of, and it, just as you're saying this, I had this idea, so I shouldn't say I see it because that makes it makes it sound like I've contemplated this. But I did, I was just thinking as you were saying it, there are kind of two entities that might fix stuff. The three. One would be my favorite, which would be all human beings realize there's no such thing as government. It's a superstition. It's a there's no such thing as authority. Uh, go out and be good people. Hire people to help you with stuff you need, like protection or or fixing your electrical outlets or whatever you need. Hire people to help you with that stuff. And there's no government. Don't let people steal 18 percent or 35 percent of your money that you earn each year. It doesn't exist. Ignore it. Make it go away. So that would be ideal. The second way to stop bad cops, I see, would be for the government administrators to do it, to hire people with a completely different profile than we were psychologically profile, profiled for in the 90s, and hire people who truly are hardcore, like they all have black belts, and they're all really tough, hardcore people who also have empathetic, loving hearts and want to help people. And you never cross them, but they never mess with you either unless you're really hurting somebody. So right. trusting government, the bureaucrats to do that, that would be another option. I don't think that's going to happen. The third option, I also don't think the first option is going to happen quickly uh, of people coming to their senses and realizing that government isn't a legitimate organizational type. Um, I think that the third, which is, is most likely if cops are brave, and that would be for the line cop the officer, the deputy, the sergeant, the lieutenant to stand up and say, nope, with all due respect, boss, um, more than happy to do the, the stuff that I think should be done, but kind of think of me as a protector and you're sponsoring me. Don't think of me as your little bitch who you get to tell, go give that person a ticket for this little infraction or go do this or that. But actually stand up and say, yeah, we're at this time. There's this demographic drought. There, there's nobody to work. You're having trouble finding people. I'm here and eager to go out and do good stuff and keep people safe. If you also want me to be a bureaucrat that picks on people, not interested, I'll go find a job. I'll make twice as much as an electrician. I don't care. I'll go do something else. I don't need this, but I'm right. happy to stay and do what I love, which is protecting people, but I'm only going to do it according to my standards. Yep. And, they, and if they're willing to do that, there's, uh, you know, I think like you and I had talked about before is there's going to be some that are going to get fired for thinking that way. But yep. if everyone starts doing it and that becomes the new law enforcement culture and the new law enforcement trend, they can't fire everyone. Yep. And, you know, so yeah, some people are going to have to quote, take one for the team. I mean, that's another thing that they teach us, right? Take, you got to take one for the team. Yep. <laughs> yep. And, but yeah, if, if, they could change the culture into something more like that. That would be amazing. That would be great. Yep. Yep. Well, hopefully that will happen. That would sure be, that would be neat to see. Um, yeah. So if you're a, if you're a cop watching this, um, you, I'm sure you've had different experiences than we had, but I'm sure you've also experienced some of the same stuff we're talking about. Uh, there's a book, uh, there's a, by written by a psychologist in Sacramento police department, um, married to a cop or something like that. And it talks about the stressors and the stressors aren't the bad guys. 
Like if you're a cop, if you're a real cop, not if you're a master's degree, tiny little person who just got into it. No offense if you're a small person. It's just, there are certain jobs that there's a reason you don't hire a poodle to be your protective dog. I mean, there's a reason for that. And it's the same thing in, you know, law enforcement or security or whatever, you know, kind of handy to have big people doing it. So if you're a little person that got in because of your color or gender or whatever, and you're not really a rough, tough, brave person, then yeah, this might be a little bit offensive to you. But talking to the people who are really rough and tough uh, and can handle themselves, if you're having challenges uh, with this, reach out to me. Let's, let's at least chat. If you're not real willing to step up yet, maybe you will be in time. But be in touch if you ever need somebody to talk to. I'm here. Tony's here. I'll bet you Rayford Davis, the guy that I heard recently, I don't know him. I'll bet you he's there to chat with you. And it's kind of different when you can sit around over a, a whiskey or a beer with a, a person and say, hey, yeah, I, I know the thin blue line stuff. We were on the same team. Let's let's kind of fix ourselves and, and get out of this and, and man up. Um, just know that there are a handful of people there that uh, if you don't like my style and you like somebody else's, let me know. I can help put you in touch with some people. And uh, yeah, let's let's fix this stuff and and man up. I think it's uh, I think it's time. Yep, I agree. That would be wonderful. And on the side note, um, as far as the rough and tough goes, if you do see me on the street, I am not rough and tough. Please don't try to hurt me. My back hurts. My knees hurt. And, <laughs> I, you know, I have no desire, but I will talk to you all day long. Just please yeah. don't hurt me. <laughs> <laughs> You know, exactly the same, exactly the same. <laughs> However, now having said that, and you're, you're smart and you're humble, the whole gray man thing of <laughs> the tough guys never tell you that they are. They're the ones, oh no, anybody yeah. could kick my butt. Please don't hurt me. Don't no, trust me. <laughs> yeah. However, there is that certain thing that I think all men have within them. You and I, we're the old dogs, we're the silverbacks that in our day, we could, you know, do stuff. But yeah, now we have no desire to be the rough and tough guys, but the silverback is still every so often has to tangle with a new bull that thinks he's going to come in and, and rape all the cows in the elk herd. Um, and the old bull says, no, 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 those are mine. And, you know, so that there's, there's still that toughness that I think you and I have to man up and have. And I don't think it's so much a physical thing as what we're doing right now, being vulnerable, getting on there and saying, hey, I'm Shepard, I'm Tony, I messed up. I spent a lot of years messing up and I hurt a lot of people and I'm really sorry. And that ain't easy. No, it's not. Yeah. It's humbling. Well, yeah, it is, it is. Well, thank you all for watching. And if you would subscribe, that would mean a ton. Ring that little bell so you get notifications. Please leave a comment, chew us out compliment us, whatever, uh, but comment, be in touch. Thanks for watching.